Um, hello, everyone. My name is Felix. Um, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to present today our work um, that our group does um, together with the Open Earth uh, Monitor project. Um, so, this is no. Yeah. Oop. Okay, perfect. Um, so let's start uh, with this this image and just looking. At this forest, you can see it's alive, it's intact, it thrives um, with diversity. And you have an endless connection of species interacting together, um, where the survival of each of these is probably dependent on other species being present. Yet one problem, before we truly understand what's happening here in this ecosystem, we have really started changing it at a global scale. So we have extracted a lot, lots of resources and we have um, degraded these lands over time. And now um, we come to understand that we need the diversity and the, the species, all these connections that we had before. And a land like this cannot support us in the long term. So the question is, how, first of all, did we get there in this, this degraded state of land? And more importantly, for the areas where it is possible, how do we go back to this intact connection of species interaction? And what we really focus on is the biophysical traits of this system. How do this forest, these vegetation traits, um, how can we quantify them and how do, we, how do they change when they move from left to right or right to left? And the biggest ally we have uh, in measuring this is, of course, the sun because every day it emits a, a constant spectrum, sort of, and we can put the satellite up there and observe the reflectance. And what vegetation does with this radiation is quite complex. So you have the canopy, the different elements, the structure of the canopy that will tell you something or that, uh, um, that is guiding how the reflectance look like. And when you zoom in, you have to understand that there is a, a fundamental unit in vegetation. It's the leaves and the components in leaves. So the chlorophyll or the fundamental building blocks making use of this sun energy. And the concentration, for instance, of chlorophyll, the water content in these leaves has a direct effect on which reflectance we observe. And there is other effects. So how do you look on a pixel? What's the geometry of observation? What's the background reflectance of the soil? Some radiation will be directly reflected by the soil. So all these factors you have to take into account. And this is what's done with so-called um, radiative transfer model. Depending on all these um, traits that you have in a canopy, this pro-sale radiative transfer model um, simulates the expected reflectance that the satellite would have. And you can use this information to sort of um, generate simula simulated reflectances. Basically, you generate your own training data. Um, so we start, we, we define the traits, we set all these parameters of these models. We can apply the pro-sale mechanistic model to get the expected simulated reflectance. And then you go the other way around. So you use the simulated reflectances, um, you use as a label um, one of the traits that you have defined in your, as your inputs and you apply any kind of machine learning model. This process is called like hybrid model inversion. You use a machine learning model to invert the mechanistic model. And then you can take this model and of course apply it um, to the satellite di data directly and then um, obtain global predictions. Okay, but one thing, um, so which, which of these traits will I talk about today and which of these traits have you measured um, around the globe? So this is um, leaf area, area index, FAPAR and fractional cover. For instance, leaf area index tells you the total area of leaves if you put them um, next to each other compared to the ground area. And it's a direct biophysical quantity of, for instance, um, evapotranspiration, so how much water um, uh, transpires. Um, 
Far power, for instance, is directly linked to the primary productivity of a, of a canopy. And fractional cover, of course, tells us more how soil, vegetation, and the atmosphere um, interacts. The way you work, uh, the way you obtain these measurements, for instance, in the field, um, leaf area index, you can either cut down the whole plot of land and put the leaves next to each other, but this is not very practical, of course. Um, so, for instance, you use this um, these fish lens photographies and based on the, on the gaps, based on the amount of, um, of sky that you see, you can, uh, you can estimate the leaf area index in this canopy. And you're not taking one picture, but let's say in a 20 by 20 um, meter grid, you take like nine pictures and get an estimate what's the leaf area index for this site. And this is how we get our in C2 validation data. And this is very essential. Here in our approach, uh, the in C2 data has a little bit a, a different role because alongside we have this mechanistic model that I showed before. But let's look at what we do with the in C2 data. So we have this global, almost global um, database of in C2 data. We couple it with the Sentinel-2 reflectance, so the, the closest matching reflectance, of course, uh, ensuring that it's not too far away, the observation. Then we split this data um, into different, different groups, different faults, and we do this based on an ecoregion approach so that observations from the same ecoregion either only occur in the validation train data or the validation test data. And this validation train data now has an essential role in our modeling loop, sort of. So, um, we started with this, defining the input rate ranges, um, applying the mechanistic model to simulate the expected reflectances. We then train uh, a machine learning model to invert um, this mechanistic model. And here is where the in situ validation data sort of enters the loop. We assess the performance of this on um, the val in situ validation data. We then keep track of this performance and restart the whole cycle because there is many decisions that we have taken during this course. How do we define the input ranges? How do we exactly parameterize the, the radiative transfer model? Which machine learning model shall we use to, to invert this model? Um, so we're using Bayesian optimization to actually optimize all these choices. And then you do this a couple of thousand iterations and then you end up with a model and you can use your, your test split uh, of the validation data to actually um, assess the performance. How would our model perform on an unseen, in an unseen ecoregion? So this is our approach. Um, we have this combination of the mechanistic model. Um, we optimize the decisions we do there using the data-driven in situ um, approach. Now, these, these are the global um, results. We have um, around 5,500 observations, for instance, for leaf area index. And here you see the true values against the predicted values. And similarly for FAPAR or F cover, um, you can do the same exercise. And you see around um, how, yeah, you can estimate with this plot how good um, how good you generalize to an unseen ecoregion. Now, we now have trained this model and now we need to apply it globally. So we have this huge data catalog of Sentinel-2 reflectances in the orders of petabytes and we need to reduce this data, of course. The first thing, which, um, which time of the year, which time of the vegetation cycle are we trying to to describe. And we really want to have a product, an annual product, that's capturing the peak of the growing season. Um, we're not interested in these leaf area index in winter uh, in a deciduous forest, for instance. So we do this on a Sentinel-2 tile level. So for all the same Sentinel-2 tiles from the same location on Earth, we look at the highest NDVI value and select the highest of them um, also having a bunch of thresholds that the, the tile level and DVI cannot be below, uh, uh, lower than a certain fraction of the highest value. 
and we mask out all agriculture in this NDVI calculations because we're not interested in, in the patterns of irrigated croplands. We really want to capture natural vegetation. We then combine this with the pre-computed cloud score plus collection um, to getting rid of all clouds and artifacts in the images and we now have this smaller stack of masked um, Sentinel-2 observations. And now we bring in the trained models um, from our loop before, from our training loop. And actually we have one model per, uh, per um, k-fold split, per uh, fold that we, a cross-validation fold. So we have a model ensemble there. And we randomly assign one of the models to each of these images. Um, sort of a programmatic way of, of applying this ensemble without actually um, using too much computation. And then, one challenge, of course, you have to translate your, your model, which we um, implemented in scikit-learn, and you have to translate it to actually predict on a Google Earth Engine asset. Um, so this was a, a bit of work to do, and we will also share some code uh, when we publish it. And then you aggregate all the predictions into a mean, uh, a standard deviation, and the number of observations per pixel. And the uncertainty estimate here is, is a bit convoluted. On one hand, it's the variation across the different Sentinel-2 tiles during peak vegetation phase. On the other hand, it's the disagreement between the model ensemble members. And they're all captured in this standard deviation layer. Okay, we now have these uh, global maps of these three traits, and they're huge in data and in size, currently at 100 meter resolution from the year 2019 onwards. But this is not where we, where we would like to end up with this project. First, um, the Sentinel-2 data, of course, offers higher spatial resolution, so we are thinking about doing it at 20 meter resolution, and it's doable in a in a reasonable amount of, of time and computation. But importantly, we also look at other traits that this mechanistic model would allow us to, to retrieve. So specifically, leaf chlorophyll or canopy chlorophyll content, then leaf water and leaf dry matter content. And we're working on that um, to make this approach possible also for these traits. Now, this is one part of, of what we do, these biophysical global trait maps. Uh, and in a second task for the project, we're looking at how can we collapse all this information in a more um, bio biodiversity relevant quantity. And so we take our trait maps, we combine it with other biophysical trait maps, for instance, canopy height or above ground biomass, everything that, that we cannot do with our approach, and we estimate a sense of functional diversity. So you can think about for a given pixel, you look at the neighborhood of pixels, and in this multidimensional space, you plot all the different trait values, and you apply some functional diversity metrics like richness, divergence, evenness, and so on, um, to better um, describe sort of the ecological meaning of diversity in this area. Okay, so having talked about all this, um, I want to introduce our stakeholder in the, pros, uh, in the project, our use case, which is um, the Restore platform. It's a global platform and community um, where basically any restoration effort um, um, should be brought together. Um, it's really this community building of all these restoration projects. And it's quite easy. Um, you go on the platform, you draw a polygon, maybe for your site that you're working on, and you give some metadata. What do you do there? Uh, do you plant some, some agroforestry, or are you um, doing a reforestation project on this? And what you get in return is, is sort of um, first, you have the community, so the outreach. You see in the neighborhood who else is doing maybe a similar thing. You can exchange. You get scientific data about it, maybe which species are supposed to grow there and so on. Um, one of these projects here um, is uh, that I want to highlight a little bit more is uh, located on the Yucatan Peninsula. 
Um, so this is uh, an area in Mexico, and this is a, um, a plot specifically of about four square kilometers, so it's quite huge in size, um, where they are um, actively restoring this land and they're actually um, doing a reforestation project. The post-intervention type that you see here is, is actually wrong, uh, that is mentioned here. But how can we use now our data to sort of help this project to evaluate and get a sense of how their reforestation monitoring, uh, reforestation project is doing? So if you look at this site more specifically, um, this used to be like 30 years ago, it used to be intact, mostly intact primary forest. And the Yucatan Peninsula is a, a tropical forest ecosystem where the Mayans have lived like thousands of years ago. And then 20, 30 years ago, this specific plot of land was cleared. It was used for, for uh, cattle grazing and recently was abandoned actually. I don't know why, but I would assume that the land was not supporting uh, the, the animals or the humans living there anymore as, as good. But we have a huge area of abandoned land which used to be intact, um, intact diverse forest. So we try to restore this piece of land, of course. And this is a time series that you get on the, on the restore platform. And at some point during this time series, um, they started um, planting large scale um, systematic tree planting. And from this time series, it's actually difficult to spot when should this have happened because you have so many phenological uh, phenomenon playing in and the size of a single tree seedling, of course, cannot be seen at this resolution. Um, so let's see how we can use our, our trade, trade data to do this. Um, for that, I redrawn uh, the polygon on top, of, on top of the leaf area index map that we've created and you can sort of look at, the, look at the time series. And you see for leaf area index or frac fractional vegetation cover that it increased from the year 2021. You have an increase and then sort of it plateaus again. But when you look in the metadata of the project site, you see that they claim they, they're actively restoring the land since 2021. So you actually see a clear signal in this. Um, but how, does, how is this really helpful? Of course, we need to have a, a little bit of a sense of what should be there. And next to this site is actually a patch of, of mainly intact primary forest, so you can redraw the same polygon to see what are sort of the, the expected trade values there. And then you can get a sense of how close you are. And of course, you don't, you don't plant the forest in two years. This takes, this takes decades. But with this tool, you might, you might be e able to, to track the progress and see how close you already are. So um, now I've talked about the single site, but let's look at all the different restore sites that there are on the platform. And you can sort of group them in different categories. And these are only reforestation projects. Um, so we have conservation projects, which is not reforestation because, uh, yeah, all the, the forest is already there. Um, but for the degraded land types, you have passive natural regeneration and active restoration. And this was the time series of one side, not, not very informative for, for, for this. And if you, if you plot many sites, it, it, it's hard to see visually what's going on. And you have also different intervention years per site. So the model class to analyze this, um, to get an overall trend over all these sites, um, you can use the linear mixed effects models. And this, this is what we did. So let's start with the conservation projects. What would you expect? How does a conservation project change after intervention? And the, the restore site data tells us actually that we have per year, the LAI is slightly increasing. And after intervention, this doesn't fundamentally change. This is what you would expect, or, or what I would expect. Let's take the passive natural vegetation. And here it's interesting that before intervention, you really have a, 
overall you have a negative trend. So leaf area index is decreasing, the land is degrading, and then the intervention happens, people start to active or to apply passive natural regeneration and you see that you invert this uh, negative trend. You stop it and you get a slightly positive one. The last example are the active restoration projects. And here, first you see that you start off from a much lower baseline. Um, so these projects usually have a, a much lower LAI in the beginning and it makes sense, you only apply active restoration on a very degraded land. And also here you see how you can stop this negative trend and revert it, even though like, the, the effect sizes are, are very small. And this is all uh, very preliminary and based on self-reported intervention types. So with this example I want to, I want to end, um, and I want to come back to this picture how we can move from, um, from the right image, these degraded lands, and give every small project on the world, in the world sort of the tools to tell to the public where they are on this trajectory, if they're trying to restore their site, where they are on this trajectory to go back to an intact forest. Thank you, everyone, uh, for listening, especially thank you to the Open Earth community. Uh, that was a very inspiring um, chance for me to enter this um, research field as a young researcher. And thanks to my direct collaborators uh, back at home. <laughs>